Good afternoon and thank you for joining us. I'm Ashley Moore and I work in the FAA's UAS Integration Office. Last June, the FAA announced its inaugural 18 test administrators for the Recreational UAS Safety Test or TRUST. But given that recreational flyers have been sharing the sky safely for nearly 100 years, why now? And why should recreational flyers take the test? Here to answer my questions, and more importantly yours, is our expert panel. Before we get started speaking to them, I have a few housekeeping items. One, this meeting is being live streamed on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. Two, if you can't stay for the whole program, you can always watch a recording of this webinar on FAA's YouTube channel later. Three, this is a very short program, so we will only be answering a few audience questions during the webinar. You can submit your questions in the comments section on YouTube or Facebook and through replies on Twitter. If the question is for a specific panelist, please say so. We are monitoring all the platforms I just mentioned so that our panelists can answer as many of your questions as possible. After the webinar, we will post Q&A highlights on our drone events webpage. Now let's meet today's illustrious panel. Kevin Morris, AKA the FAA Drone Guy, joined the FAA's Office of Communications after spending a decade with the Flight Standards Service. Kevin is passionate about embracing new technology, empowering the drone community to operate safely, and of course, hockey. Alex Suarez is the youth advocate at the FPV Freedom Coalition and the government affairs representative at MultiGP. Desi Eckstein is a woman with many hats, figuratively at least. She is an FAA drone pro, an ambassador for women and drones, and a STEM educator. Greg Reverdio is from the Pilot Institute, one of the 18 FAA approved trust administrators. And Greg loves to help people get comfortable flying their drone. A big thanks to you all for joining us today. All right, and now let's go to my first question, um, which is for the FAA drone guy, Kevin. What in the world is trust and why should recreational flyers care? Well, thanks, Ashley. Thanks for having me on and good to see everyone and, and welcome to our virtual event. And what a great question to start off the event with. What is trust? Why are we here? Well, Ashley, I think you covered a little bit in your intro, but trust is the uh, recreational UAS safety test. Uh, this is a test that's actually put into statute by Congress as being a requirement for recreational flying. So it is by law a test that any recreational flyer, and when I say that term, we're talking about recreational flyers that are flying under the exception for limited recreational operations, sometimes called section 44809. So when you're flying under that section or that provision, this test is required and it's designed for you. So this is something that the FAA did uh, to meet the statutory requirement and put out this, this recreational UAS safety test. Uh, pretty much anybody that wants to fly under that section 44809 has to take it, even if you happen to be a part 107 certificated remote pilot. There's no grandfathering, if you will, to, to that certificate saying, well, you've, you've got your remote pilot certificate. You don't need to take the trust. Actually, you do. And, and there's good reason for that. This is a question that comes up a lot. A lot of people don't understand that there are things you can do as a recreational flyer that aren't provided for under Part 107. And I'm going to take the easy example here and say, as a recreational flyer under Section 44809, you can fly a larger than 55 pound drone. Well, clearly we can't do that under part 107. So others, there are some differences. So I recommend that anybody have the opportunity to take the test. It's certainly required. There is no age minimum or maximum to take the test. So we encourage everyone before they go out and fly their drone for the first time, log in, take the trust, learn a little bit, and you'll be a safer flyer for it. Thanks for that, Kevin. I think it's important to know, uh, you know, we're hosting this whole webinar about trust, but what is it? So thanks for that uh, very concise explanation. My next question is a lightning round for all of our panelists. Tell me one thing you learned when taking trust. And Kevin, since you were just our, our last speaker, we'll go ahead and start again with you. Uh, well, that, that's a really good question. Um, 
I was actually part of the team that developed the trust. Uh, so there's a lot of things in the trust that um, I personally wrote or other people on the team wrote. Um, I think the best part about what we've done with the trust is that uh, we've made this something that pretty much anybody can get through. You don't have to be an aviation genius to make it through the recreational UAS safety test. Trust is designed to provide you a little bit of knowledge and then check that knowledge with a couple of questions and then provide you with a little bit more knowledge and check that knowledge. Um, I, I think on average, we, we met our goals of making it maybe less than 30 minutes maximum. If you took the time to read every single word in that and took your time to think about answers, I think most people, and Greg could probably speak to this a little bit, uh, probably get through it in about 15 minutes, I think would be about the average. And maybe the best part is that it's free. So one of the things I learned about it when we did this trust, we, we delivered it and we worked with our test ministers to get it out is that I didn't get a lot of hate mail <laughs> when, when it did finally roll out. And that, that's, that's quite remarkable uh, when you're introducing a new program, which is a new requirement for people flying drones. I think generally it was fairly well uh, accepted by the drone community. So I, I learned a few things that working with industry to develop a product like that is really the way to go. That's how you want to put out a product that everybody can use. All right. Well, thank you for that. And I'm so happy you didn't get hate mail. I'm <laughs> glad to hear it. <laughs> so Alex, let's go to you next. Uh, what did well, you learn? I learned that I don't need to study for it. It's easy. It's, it doesn't take much time at all. I was able to do it and move on and uh, didn't take much time out of my day. And it's just not too difficult and plenty of places to take it at. So yeah, very well, easy to access and do. All right, I'm glad to hear that. And then Desi, I know you're also an experienced pilot. Uh, so tell us, did you, what did you learn uh, when taking trust? So I actually was very pleased with the way it was laid out and the amount of information that was provided. I know um, it's scary to take a test. And so having all that information there presented in a, in a nice manner was just really, really key for me. Mm -hmm. That's good to know. So Greg, and you're a, you're a trust administrator. So talk to us here. What did you learn? Well, I learned that actually that we can work together as an industry to create something as great as trust, which is great training, I think, for uh, everyone involved, something that we really, really need to have around. And as Kevin said, I think the reception has been really good from the community. Uh, this is free training. It's a no brainer. And uh, I'm sure you'll learn something. We, I'm amazed at how many people come back to us and say, um, I've actually learned something from this that I didn't know before. So it's, uh, it's doing its job. Yeah. All right. Well, Greg, thank you for that. And I have another question for you, Greg. Uh, one question I've heard from a lot of recreational flyers is why are organizations like yours the ones offering this test? That's a great question. Uh, the FAA really wanted to leverage the information and, and uh, the, the skills from both sides of the FAA with their expertise with safety and then uh, organizations like Pilot Institute that have a great following of, uh, of pilots. So we help with spread the word on behalf of the FA. Uh, now you mentioned, you know, how does somebody know that uh, we are an actual provider and, and trusted by the FA? Uh, that's gonna be with a logo. There is a logo on the FA website uh, that we put on our website to recognize that we are a trust provider. Uh, the, uh, the FAA website is also a great place where you can find information. You can also find information about the trust provider in the full list on uh, Before You Fly, the app that you should be downloading and have on your phone at all times. And then it's free. This is, this is a free course. So uh, it takes about 15 minutes, like Kevin said. We tell people 30, but we find it takes about 15 minutes to get everything done. Uh, now, you don't get any lanyards. You don't get any card. The FAA doesn't send you anything. You're going to get just a, a simple PDF document that you download and you put uh, on your computer or you can print it. And, uh, and like I said, it's free. And I'm going to say it again. And I know Kevin is going to say it again as well. Make sure it's free. Now, we've, uh, we've actually issued 78,000 of these. I just checked this morning. Uh, uh, in the community. So we're, we're really excited to be working with the FA on that and uh, spreading the word. All right. Thank you so much. And can you repeat that price for everyone again, Greg? Yep, that's right. It's zero dollars. It's free. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I think that's an important highlight that I hope people will take away from this conversation today. Uh, next up, Desi, let's hear a little bit more from you 
uh, you're an ambassador for women and drones. What can people do to spread awareness about trust and help new flyers gain confidence? So there are many opportunities out there for networking and becoming a mentor. So we all have a passion for flying and there's an opportunity for you to do an outreach with that. Um, I encourage people to share that passion that you have and find uh, opportunities to share. Um, one of the ways that I personally do it is through not only through the uh, Women in Drones Network, but also through the Drone Pros. Uh, drone pros have an opportunity to either do webinars, outreach programs, uh, host community events. And so there are all ways to share that trust is an, uh, a, a test that needs to be taken and it's required for recreational flyers and also to maybe ease things a little bit. Because I know doing a lot of the STEM programs, when I tell somebody that, OK, we're going to go through and do the trust, the first thing is panic and, oh no, I'm gonna do a test. And so it, it actually, when I said earlier how nice it's laid out, it actually provides uh, the knowledge in such a way that it just really eases your mind about things. And then just the bottom line is we're trying to promote safety. We wanna make sure that we are ambassadors for the industry and we are promoting safety for not only just the drone community, but aviation as a whole, because we want this to continue. All right, thank you for that, Desi. I really appreciate it. Um, Alex, so you're next up and I'm gonna pick on you a little bit because I know you're an FPV flyer. Um, yeah. So can you explain to us just a little bit about what FPV even is, what that means, what it stands for, what kind of things you all do, and why is it important for FPV pilots to take trust? So FPV stands for first person view and it's a type of flying where we use cameras on our drones, but not for pictures but to fly with. So it's not as high of a quality. And they send a they send that video feed from the camera to a pair of goggles that we'll usually put on. And we can see exactly what the drone's seeing, just like if we're on, on the aircraft itself. And so we'll fly around through different types of trees, maybe some buildings, and go around different structures. And sometimes we'll also race them. So that's a very large part of the community too. So we have what's called freestyle, which is a lot of tricks and going through different obstacles. And then we have racing where it's all about that, all about the speed and trying to go through different gates as fast as you can. Um, and so with trust and FPV, there's actually two questions on trust that talk about FPV. And so it's, important to take a look at those questions because while most FPV pilots generally know to avoid people and that kind of stuff, there's still the airspace above them, even though we're generally low, accidents can happen. Your quad could do what's called going to the moon, uh, is what we call it, and basically just launch up and lose control a little bit. So you gotta understand how to how what's going on with the airspace above you too um, so yeah all right well thank you so much for that alex I, and i'm gonna date myself a little bit here but it sounds kind of something along the lines of honey i shrunk the kids you know you're getting that first person perspective on, on what you're flying around and seeing so pretty cool thank you for sharing that with us mm -hmm. So just a reminder to folks, um, our panelists are here to answer your questions about trust as well. Uh, so please submit them through the comment section on YouTube or Facebook and by uh, submitting a reply on Twitter. Uh, and then we'll start pulling those questions and asking our panelists. Um, we do have a first question that I wanna kick things off with, which I'm happy to see here um, for Kevin. Um, what happens if the regulations change? Will recreational flyers need to take trust again? Yeah, uh, thanks, Ashley. That's an easy one. Regulations don't change. We all know that. They say that they say the same forever. Uh, no, in all seriousness, uh, that's going to be something we'll have to find out. I mean, the, the short answer is we don't know. We don't know what uh, maybe new statutes are going to come out from Congress. We don't know what type of rules that they're going to ask us to adapt and, and work with. 
Uh, so that's a bit of an unknown. So the way the trust is set up right now is, again, to meet that congressional statute requirement that we provide this and that people take the test. Now, Congress did not say they have to take it every three years or every two years or every five years. They just said it needs to be taken. So right now, we're, we're kind of at a one and done. So when you go and you take this test, you log and you take it. Now, as Greg pointed out, you can take it as many times as you want because it's free and it's online. It's super easy to get to. Uh, but there is no requirement to go back and take it again. Now, before, before we get a little crazy here, I would like to throw in that uh, when rules do change, uh, when there are updates or when there's some new technology that may be incorporated into recreational flying, we will certainly update the recreational UAS safety test content. So the information in that can change. But as of right now, there's no requirement to go back and take that again. This is where I get to my soapbox and say a good pilot is always learning. So just because you went and you took the trust, or maybe even just because you went and got your Part 107 remote pilot certificate, doesn't mean your learning is done. That's really just the start. Uh, when, when we look at that certificate under Part 107, or when we're talking about the trust here, that printout, that PDF that Greg mentioned, that is the first step in your drone piloting career. Uh, there is no end to the amount of information you can learn, nor would I ever recommend take the trust done and never look at the rules or community guidelines or best practices ever again. Because as you know, as Alex is pointing out with FPV, that's continually changing with the technology and the capabilities of FPV drones. So you always want to be in this learning mode. So we don't know what's coming with rules, but we certainly will adapt to them. And I do recommend people take as much time to learn as much as they can about drones on a continuing basis. Mm -hmm. All right. And thank you so much for that, Kevin. And can you just repeat for us, what is the price again? I want to check. If I remember correctly, it is absolutely free to take the trust. <laughs> well, thank you for that. I wish I had one of those flashing signs, you know. <laughs> uh, all right. Thanks, Kevin. Alex, uh, let's kick a question yeah. over to you. Let's talk a little bit about uh, the, the height. Here. So if you're flying under 250 feet, tell me, tell me here, is trust still required? Uh, flying at any altitude, uh, as long as, and mainly as long as what you're supposed to be under 400 feet, you do need trust as a recreational pilot. And there's also a question that I've also heard of people talking about the weight requirement, uh, or like, since registration is tied to if your aircraft, if your drone's over 0.55 pounds, you need to register but trust is different. It is not, so you have to take it even if you're flying an aircraft under 0.55 pounds too. So um, that's a misconception I've heard a couple of times is, oh, I'm flying this small aircraft and I don't need trust, but trust isn't like the registration requirement. It's separate. All right, thanks for that, Alex. I really appreciate it. Okay, and let's, I'm going to take a quick look. Um, and, and I think we've already covered this, uh, but I do have a question I think is certainly worth repeating. Is there a minimum age to take trust? And I'll kick that question over to you, Desi, uh, so, so that you can repeat that, because I know you do a lot of STEM education work. Right. Yeah. And that's one of the great things about it. There is not a uh, minimum age and it's a great opportunity for learning about the airspace that you'll be flying in and to just reach out in, and do a, educational awareness of where you're going to be flying and some of the rules and regulations about it. And so uh, great question. Yes. Yeah. And if you could just repeat for us again, I just want to take every opportunity to drive this point home. What is the cost of all of this, um, you know, features we have packed into this one educational opportunity? This is free. <laughs> take this exam, this test, right? It's free. Also, I want to point out one thing also that I know some of the girls that I uh, deal with is that panic that they have. You, it's also, you'll pass, go through the material, it's all there, it's all laid out, and you'll pass, you'll get the 100%. And that's what it takes to actually pass it. But you get to go back and do it again until you do. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for that. I think that that's also a really worthwhile point, too. You know, it's really an educational opportunity. You, you can retake it. And the point is for you to learn something so that you can be a safe uh, member of the aviation community. So I really appreciate you pointing that out. Okay. All right. I'm going to take a look to see if we have any more questions here. 
And Ashley, I can add a little bit more to the, to the age thing, because that this does come up a lot in, in terms of how do we expect a kid to pass an FAA test? Uh, so I, so let me get into that just a little bit more when we're talking about the age and, and having no minimum age technically required by statute. Uh, when we designed this test, uh, we went through a lot of iterations and, and we went around and around on language. And if you can imagine what our goal was to write this test down to a sixth grade reading level. So my son, for example, my youngest son uh, is just finishing up uh, sixth grade. So I, I was sort of trying to write this test so that he could read it without any of my help, understand what we're trying to say and pass it. Now, that's a huge lift. If you really think about it, you, you take these concepts like classes of airspace and restricted airspace and community-based organizations and, and fixed flying sites and FAA airspace authorization. You take a lot of these uh, really, uh, if you will, adult type concepts and try to boil them down into uh, a language that a, a younger person can understand. That was a huge challenge for the team. And, and it's one of those success stories, as Greg was mentioning, between the FAA and organizations in the drone community to create this test, to have it be successful. Now, I'll say my son, he, he, he took it, uh, he passed it, and he walks around bragging to everyone now that he's a certificated drone pilot, which, of course, the FAA and me has to correct him every time he says that. I said, but you did a good job. You passed the trust. We can go out and fly that drone for fun. But yeah, to Desi's point, there is no minimum age. And we did a lot of work at the FAA as well as with our collaboration with industry to make sure that the younger generation could take this and understand it and pass it. Yeah, I'm sure the younger drone enthusiasts really appreciate that as well, having the opportunity to, to still get to participate in such an exciting new hobby. Yeah, thanks, Kevin. Um, one question uh, that we do have, uh, which I think is de definitely worth repeating, and Greg is probably a great question for you, um, you know, in terms of knowing where you can take trust and how to find that information. Um, can you give us a reminder there about uh, some of the signs that you're on a trusted website for trust? Yep. So absolutely. So the logo is definitely one of them. Make sure the logo is on there. Also make sure that uh, the uh, website you went from the FAA website, so FAA.gov, and, uh, and then get the link directly from there. Uh, there is also a link directly in uh, the uh, Before You Fly app. So make sure you go into the Before You Fly app and then you'll be able to get that information. And again, it's free. And uh, if you're not on the website and you see dollar signs, you're probably not in the right place. Yeah, yeah, because the price is free. <laughs> so thanks so much for that. Um, and then another question, uh, how many questions are on the trust? And I think that's a good one for you as well, Greg. So we'll stick with you for a moment. Yeah, it's uh, it's twenty questions. It's twenty questions. You got you got me. I haven't done it in a while. I think it's twenty questions. Kevin can probably uh, confirm. Uh, the questions are actually spread out throughout the entire course. So you'll be seeing a few slides, a bit of information, then you'll have a quiz, then you'll move on to the next session, uh, get a, a few more uh, slides with information, and then another quiz. So it's not very difficult. If you miss the question, uh, each provider is a little bit different, but at least on our website, if you miss one of the questions, it will tell you right away. It will give you feedback and give you a chance to uh, go back and correct it and then submit it. So you can't fail the test. You cannot fail this test. And, uh, and then you'll be on your way out. Okay. All right. Thanks for that. And then Kevin, did you have anything at, to add to Greg's response there? No, I think he got the number of questions right. It's been a while since, since I took it as well. Uh, but uh, he, I, I think we're right around that 20 question mark. And, and whether you, you use one test administrator or another, I think we have 18 ish now. I, I would have to look at that number. Uh, but they're all going to be the same test. So you're not going to get a different set of questions if you used one test administrator as opposed to another. Uh, part of our agreement in our working relationship with our approved test administrators is that they deliver the, the trust as is. So it's the same content you're going to get. Um, it, it might have a different maybe look or feel or maybe some of the graphics packages might be slightly different from test administrator, test administrator, but the content the questions, your selectable answers are all going to be the same. So that's part of our try to make it a uniform test across all of our test administrators uh, so that, you know, somebody, you know, maybe Greg thinks it's, it's better to have a four hour long uh, trust for users to take. And well, he, he can't really do that. It, it's, it's the information he has to use is the FAA information, which we routinely look at. I, again, I mentioned, what do we do if things change? Well, we, we look at our trust content on an annual basis and we have conversations with our test administrators to see, 
hey, is it working like we thought? Do we need to change some things? Um, are you still interested in doing it? Do we need to bring some more on? So we're constantly looking at improving that program. Yeah, thanks for that. I appreciate the, the ongoing look towards improvement. And I have another question, which I think is probably best for you, Kevin, and really two questions that go together. The first part being, why do I have to print out the certificate at the end? And do I have to show that certificate to anyone? Um, well, I'm going to defer the, the printing out one maybe to Greg, because my guess is you couldn't print out the certificate at the beginning and then not take the trust. So um, I'm going to let Greg handle that one. But certainly for the who do you have to show the trust certificate to, uh, the, the law requires that you show it to either law enforcement personnel, so think police officers, or FAA personnel. So if you're approached by one of those two individuals and they show you their credentials and say, hey, I'm a I'm an FAA inspector or I'm a police officer. Uh, I see you flying your drone here. Do you happen to have your trust completion certificate? You are required to show that to them. Now, it doesn't have to be on paper. It can be on your phone. It can be a digital copy of that. But there is a requirement in the law that you do provide that. So they can ask and you would need to show that completion certificate to those individuals. Yeah. All right. Thanks for that. Very helpful reminder, Kevin. All right. And then, Greg, did you have anything to add to Kevin's comments there? Yeah, I think Kevin answered the question, but I do want to add that uh, make sure you download that certificate at the very end because it disappears once you close that window. We as trust provider uh, uh, partners, we cannot uh, save the data and we cannot save that certificate for you or save your name or your email. So if you were to email me and say, hey, Greg, I took the, the trust on your website, I'd be like, that's great, but I have no way to verify that because we're not allowed to keep that data. So if you say I lost my certificate, um, I can't recover it. You have to take the trust again. So it's important at the very end that you save that PDF document. Uh, you can save it as, as a PDF and show the PDF on your phone uh, to the FAA, or you can just print it and have it in your record. Either way works. Okay. All right. Thanks for that. So, so it's important to be responsible once you finish that test and make sure you're, you're preserving that digital file. I could add one more thing to the um, oh, printing out of it. So the PDF that you get, it's a little messy. So it doesn't necessarily print very well where it's back to back. So you might have to mess with it a little bit if you want it to look really nice and get it to be front and back on the same side, then cut it out. Or you could do the old fashion tape it together method um, all depends on what you prefer but there's a you might have to do a little bit of work if you want it to look a little bit nicer okay all right thanks for that and then we have another question it's probably a good one for you as well and let's get alex and desi back in the conversation so you are both part 107 pilots did you have to take the trust so alex yes. let's start with you yes i took it um I, i'm while i do have my 107 i mostly fly recreationally so I have the option to use my 107, but I most of my flights are recreational flights, so I need the trust. Um, I well, I need trust, not the trust, but uh, everyone makes the mistake. So, yeah. Uh, but yeah. Uh, All right, and then Desi, can you talk to us too a little bit about why and the differentiation there between a, a rec flyer and a, a Part 107 flyer? So when you are flying for recreational purposes, there are guidelines that you would want to adhere to. Um, and so it's under um, 44108 or 109, sorry, <laughs> look at me. Um, and so uh, you need to go through and look at all eight of those. And if you don't fall under those um, exceptions, then you would be actually flying under part 107. And so not every flight that you go out and do is actually going to be a commercial flight. There are, like Alex just said, times that you're just going to go out and fly for fun. And in cases like that, you would need to be adhering to those uh, regulations for recreational flyers. And so it, it's encouraged that you would take that exam, even if test, even if you are uh, part 107 uh, pilot. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much for that. And then Kevin, I'll give you a chance if there's anything you want to add as our FAA drone guy. <laughs> I, I think Desi did a great job. Desi's um, one of our drone pros uh, and definitely goes out and does a lot of work on behalf of, of the FAA to share our safety message. So I, Desi, you left me speechless. That was fantastic. 
All right. Well, thank you. It's not often we see Kevin speechless. I can say that as a colleague. <laughs> so I just want to thank everyone uh, so much for joining today's panel. We're right at half an hour. So the producers are giving me the hook. Um, but it's been a fantastic conversation. Um, and this is only the first um, in, in several of the, the Flying for Fun series webinars that we have this summer. They're just short webinars designed to explain key topics uh, for new recreational flyers uh, so that you can get out there and enjoy some summer fun. Uh, for more information, you can see our website there on the screen. Uh, check that out. You can find out more about the 18 uh, test administrators that we currently have for trust um, and their very, very low price of free uh, for taking this important test. Uh, so thanks so much, everyone, for joining us, and we hope that you'll fly safely.